welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. This is episode number 288. That's dos, ocho, ocho. Como estas, mi amigos y mi amigas? Cool. Hope you guys are good and feeling alive. I'm feeling excellent. I'm feeling great. It's now Friday, end of the week. The weekend's approaching. All you guys that hate your jobs and hate your lives, you're going to be looking forward to this weekend to get hyphy, put your hands in the air, dance around that you don't care, right? You're going to love it. You're going to love it. It's coming up this weekend, man. you got the weekend coming up. And for those of you working part-time or freelancing, you won't care because every day feels like a weekend. You get up, you do your little task, you do your little job, you send off your um, assignments to your place of work, they then hopefully pay it in the week and everything continues as is. So everyone, hope you're doing well, hope you're doing fine. I'm doing amazing, I'm doing great. I've just come back from a great, amazing workout. Did loads of deadlifts, did some power cleans, I did some overhead presses. And tonight, this evening, after I come back from work, I'm going to go out and do a little four-mile run. So I'm feeling very strong, feeling very centered. I've had a nice breakfast. I've had like some scrambled eggs, a bit of mushroom, sprinkle some spinach in it and a tiny smidge of, of cheddar cheese to keep it going and a couple of frankfurters. I'm feeling strong. I'm feeling great. I'm feeling ready to go, right? Got a little bit of a glass of water here, my little cup that I'm ready to start sipping as I'm doing a podcast. Hope you guys are doing good. Hope you guys are doing great, yeah? As per usual, if you're watching this via YouTube, smash that like button, hit subscribe. If you're liking what you see, leave me a comment if you've got a question. And if you're watching or listening, so as actually via the podcast app, then please leave me a five star review on whatever platform you're using. Um, share it on your social media accounts and do the doing it. Just put it out there as you as you may please. So we're gonna get this. Uh, <clears throat> we're gonna get this podcast started in the right way because you know why not do it the right way? And we're gonna get it started with this amazing video that I actually spotted. Um, let me see if I can get it up on here. Actually, let me do this. Let me go here. Hopefully, this works out for me. I'm not sure if it is going to work out. Hopefully, it does. All right. Boom, bang, bang. Let's get this up on here, and let's start this podcast out the right way because you know there's no other way to start a podcast like this where we're going to be talking about majority. You know, majority of the things going to be streetwear focused. So I want to, I want to make sure that you guys hear this amazing stuff from this very inspirational figure to get you going uh before the weekend starts so for everyone coming back from paris for everyone coming back from work or coming back from holidays or just generally you know hanging on in there mohammed the best day things in the heavyweight the best move in the heavyweight but sorry man did it box he beat him one time. Everything is possible in your life when you believe. Oh yes. When you believe, everything is possible. Oh yes. You have a two hands. Mm-hmm. Amen. Everything is possible. Oh yes. Go. Oh. Uh-huh. Oh, gives me tingles down my spine listening to that. So if, if you're can be confused, uh, listening to that, you don't know who that is. That is one Yara Romero who's fighting this weekend against Israel Adesanya, um, an absolute beast of an UFC MMA fighter who's basically detailing the fact that, you know, I think maybe people are underestimating or maybe are putting down his chances of being Israel because Israel's looked so sensational in his past couple of victories or his past few victories actually since he's got the belt. Um, to, well, since he got the belt from Robert Whittaker. And I guess you're reminding people just how, you know, the kind of steely determination that he has to in order to win this fight. And I think it kind of carries through to your everyday life. You know, you kind of hit, you, sometimes in life you are thrown some obstacles, some uh, points where you might have to kind of recalibrate and um, think of another route as in how to get closer to your dream. You might just be confronted with some disappointment, just some pure, utter smacks in the face that might make you think, wow, man, this life is not going as great as I wanted to, right? Because sometimes you can have that false assumption that because things are getting better, your past, mis- no, because things are getting better, or because things are getting better, your brain suddenly tells you, oh, you're not going to have any more points of pain. You're not going to have any more disappointments. You're not going to have any more stumbling blocks. But actually what life actually does, it's not like a movie. It's not like you get three or four um, mistakes happen and then you suddenly go on this amazing run where everything's rosy. Usually life keeps serving you, you know, shit pie after shit pie after shit pie after shit pie. And it's up to you to decide whether or not you're just going to like give up 
and just keep guzzling that shit pie down your esophagus or whether you're going to start spatting that thing away, wiping it off your mouth and currently and just keep driving, running forward towards the goal that you want, which is a nice, sweet apple pie. Again, horrible analogy. It probably made you throw up in your mouth and you probably want to fast forward this, but just hang in on there with me. I promise I'll get around to making a good point. But I think what Yorimo is saying is something that I've been thinking about a lot and something that I've kind of heard someone like a Joko Wilnick say quite often is that... Um, there has to be a point where you do adopt a, a, a kind of framework of extreme ownership. And I've kind of got that obviously from reading Joko Wonick's book, which is an incredible book. I recommend you check it out. Extreme Ownership out now at all your favorite uh, bookstores with that malarkey. But it's a really great book because it does really, um, let's give this camera right away. It does really detail that in life, there can be a lot of struggle situations that you get put in front of or places that you are. Or just in general, in life might just might, you know, you might get dealt with a shitty hand. But the only way to deal with it, especially nowadays, especially in an era where most of the time society or, you know, the, your community isn't set up in a way to help you out or to kind of make things easier. The only thing that you can do is to kind of pick yourself up by your bootstraps, dust yourself off and go again. Because unfortunately, no one's going to save you. No one. You might think someone's going to come in, like even stuff like Job Seekers Allowance. Even stuff like asking your friends for 20 quid, right? Everyone's living paycheck to paycheck. The government's kind of squeezed out single mothers who have kids that they depend on, let alone creatives like me and you, right? Or people that are involved in the the, the arts or people that want to be involved in the entertainment industry or people that are just like, you know, looking at that sort of stuff, right? Mums that have, single mums that live in, you know, a high rise building block somewhere where the lift doesn't work are struggling to get job seekers allowance are struggling to get um, universal credit so what do you think your chances are if you're an able-bodied young person between the ages of 25 and 35 do you really think they're going to give a toss about saving you about plucking you out of your misery no are your friends going to give a shit about saving you no because your friends have to balance the books in their own household they have to make sure they have the money enough to pay for a festival that they only want to go to in order to impress friends on instagram they don't even talk to they want to make sure that they sustain or maintain their relationships that they have with an abusive boyfriend or or girlfriend they want to make sure they keep that job that they don't like but it gives them a look and it get, make, looks good in their cv so they have to go and suck their manager's penis and whatever it may be figuratively and sometimes metaphoric phys, phys, uh, phys, uh, physically and metaphorically like everyone's got their issues so no one's got the time to kind of like sit by sit by your side on a bench put their hand in your lap and look at you in the eye and really listen to your story and emote with you and connect with you and offer your solution no one's got time for that so you really have to go for your own thing because you've because there's no other option. And I also believe in the fact that as much as there are examples of exceptional people out there doing really exceptional things, there's also that bracket just underneath who are just like me and you, average folks who had a dream, who had a bit of, who had a bit of determination, who had, a, who had a bit of courage, who took the money out of their own pocket and kind of put it up themselves and chase their own dream. Those people exist too. There obviously there are those freakish talents that you can't compare yourselves to, right? The Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo of any industry do exist. But I think there's a, there's a com there's like a middle ground of people who are just the, the you know the average professional who kind of goes into their work, goes who approaches their creative endeavor like it's a job, clocks in, clocks out, shows up consistently, um, shows up on time, does good work, is a pleasure to be around and then bears all the fruits now again it's a longer process it might take a lot more time it might take might it might require more sacrifices but in the end you can get there and i think um now that i've heard that phrase reiterated again by um Yo romero something i've heard from uh joker Wolnick when i asked him a question on twitter the idea about go right go with a full stop go 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 that's all you've got you've got nothing else right you've got nothing else but to go just go get you know again th there's nothing else you can do really you can sit there and cry and kind of punch the wall. But then after that, your hand's bleeding. When your hand's broken or fractured, you have to wipe yourself off again, wrap your hand in a bandage and just keep going again. Because what else do you have? You have no other option left out there. Um, tomorrow will be a better day. And yeah, that's the kind of mission I got from Yoramo. So he kind of, as you can get, as you can say, as you can see, actually, as you can tell, Yoramo has fired me up. So much so that I'm stuttering and missing my words. But what's new in it? What's new? If you're new to the show, and you don't know this, and this is my vibe, and it's what I do. It's what we do out here. Anyway, let's get into the show. As, per, as I mentioned yesterday, today's going to be mostly streetwear-focused news, so um, bear with me with that. Loads of stuff in streetwear that I want to talk about. Loads of news out there that I think is very, is very much of interest. We're going to rattle through a few of them, and then we're going to keep it moving, right? But before we get to the streetwear news, let's go into some... Um, music we'll say music 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 yeah let's go into some music stuff um so music 
Um, Lil Uzi Vert has announced that uh, some extra details for his new album, Eternal Take. If you're a big Lil Uzi fan, Lil Uzi Vert fan, or Uzi Vert fan, you'll know that this album's been long in the making. We hit a few stumbling blocks due to um, Lil Uzi Vert's uh, ongoing drama, uh, no pun intended, with DJ Drama and his record label and Don and Canon as well. There's some issues going on there in terms of releasing music, in terms of the, the splits. Um, I think from what I've heard from Joe Budden podcast, that has been sorted or rectified behind the scenes. It wasn't announced publicly, but I think Uzi Vert is in a much better position, hence why you haven't heard him complain or talk about it too much. So this is this is this should be no surprise that we're seeing a, a ramp up in the kind of um, production and in the kind of rollout and the marketing when it comes to his new album, Eternal Take. Obviously, I think the whole concept behind it and the art direction was already kind of done before he went into the kind of argument or the public spat he had with um dj drama so this shouldn't be too much surprise but i think also the idea that the button's been pressed all these really shiny highly polished highly produced um kind of uh teasers and bits of artwork are coming out of photography shows you that the album if not is if it's not done it's obviously in this final phase where it's probably trying to clear some samples get last verses on and all that stuff and i can't wait to hear it really um i'm a big loser of a fan from the beginning i think i think from all these mixtapes to his albums he's been somebody that's been um frighteningly consistent i think the only kind of misstep he's had was the uh, was the album where um where that virgil uh, designed the artwork for I think that might have been the only one where I was kind of a little bit, I think that was his only misstep so far, but I think so so far so good. If you look at his discography and you look at the albums that he's released and you look at the singles that are on those albums or the tracks in general that are on those albums, you can't really say that he's had any kind of, he's had a misstep so far. So uh, I think it might have been Love Is Rage, you know? Yeah, Love Is Rage 2 might have been that. So that's the one that I think that was probably the, the worst one of the of the few from Lil Z Vert. Look here on the screen. So you've got here Love is Rage Year 2. That was one that off uh, Virgil designed to cut the front cover for. Um, I wasn't really a fan of the cover either, to be completely honest with me. Um, but yeah, the album wasn't that great. But if you look at the track list again, there's still some fucking banging tracks on this album. Let's go back to it again. Go through the track list. Yeah, you've got two. You've got four, 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 plus two, two, two. You source it up. you got That's the Way Life Goes. Neon Guts, of course, was one of my. That, that was a, what. That's a sleeper track. I don't think people give Neon Guts the the cre credit that it deserves for a Fre Pharrell kind of Neptune Z production kind of track. Again, maybe it didn't flow as well on the album. I think the sequencing could have been worked on a bit more. But that track was fucking insane. Um, Unfazed, of course, with the weekend was a very uh, another uh, underrated track. You got EXO Tolaf, which is probably the standout one on there. Um, and then if you look back at his uh, previous or the ones that come in between the mixtapes, you got the Perfect Love Tape, you got Love Is Rage, Real Uzi, Uzi V The World. Um, then you've got yeah, that's it in it, right? So so that's this is second album really. I've all the rest have been mixtapes, although they've been fucking stacked full of fucking tracks on them. So the Perfect Love Tape has a lot of tracks on this one as well, isn't it? All right, you got ten on this. And then on the other one, Love is uh, Lucy v, v the World. Well, how many got in that track list? Wow, what weird track list? Is that it? How many got there? You got 10, 9 on there too. So yeah, he's put out a lot of music, man. So I can't wait to see what Eternal Tech sounds like. So far, we've got some um, video of the promo that he put out that looks really cool. Kind of um, taking on board some of the... Where is, where is, where is, where I got it here? There we go. Taking on with some of the kind of uh, cultish sort of vibes. I forgot what the cult was, the one where they all committed suicide and they're all wearing purple with the um, black converses, I'm pretty sure, or like these tap trainers. So here's a kind of, uh, here's a trailer here now. See this? And what I like about it too, I think he um, he went back to the drawing board. Supposedly, if you follow his tweets, based on him sending some tracks to Tyler the Creator, I think Tyler the Creator told him he needs to come harder. He needs to, you know, put a lot more work into it. And he went back to the drawing board, which is quite cool to see that they've got this. These newer artists have this amazing peer group around them of artists who are kind of in different lanes who they can go for for different things like i think of it makes me it, it makes me think of like fearless london how he works with like tame impala right 
I think in years gone by, or, in, or even when Fear for Sullivan first started, he was working with loads of really amazing kind of indie, um, kind of indie dance kind of acts, and you know all those people and stuff and whatever, and getting them involved in his album to play guitar or to add elements onto his tracks. That seemed like a weird thing, right? Um, I think he might work with Santi Gold. Or I forgot, but he he's, a, he's got a very eclectic mix of people that he features on his tracks. At that time, that was a very strange thing for like a predominantly black hip hop artist. Uh, to be doing that kind of thing but it feels like nowadays people have taken that kind of flippers london um uh way of working or maybe the kid cuddy way of working and adopted it in their in their music regardless if they're making like melodic trap music or if they're making straight up like gangster music like they will get the best people from different genres to come and contribute to their albums because they know that those people are also listening to the tracks that they're doing and taking things from them, right? Whether it's the vocal inflectations, whether it's the instrumentations, the way drums are laid on top of each other, the melodies, everyone's taking bits of each other. And I guess nowadays with hip hop being the number one genre in the world, people are probably going to be looking more so at hip hop because they're doing things right. Because, you know, that's what human nature does, isn't it? Human nature, you look at people who are doing things correctly. If you're smart and you've got, got something about you, you look at someone who's doing something correctly or the way that you want to do it or they're in a position that you would like to be and you'll take some elements of it and apply it to your own um, artistry and to your own works and hopefully that way you'll be able to kind of push forward it's a quite a cool video to see this is what he was in the office I love his hair as well by the way now I, I don't know what this is that he's doing at the moment but he he puts it in he kind of I'm not sure if it's blow dried or if his hair is naturally quite straight anyway but it looks like it's been kind of relaxed or blade blow dried and it's going to be important to a bit of a side bun at the back. Reminds me of like the girls back in the day in my school who used to do that. That used to be a big trend back in the day. Uh, girls getting their ponytail and kind of putting it to the side. I don't know why it made girls look so hot, but I remember back in the day, I used to love that shit. Um, but it looks cool on him like that. But also like he's kind of the top braid that he's doing that you've seen Lil Yatty doing. There's been a thing this, oh, uh, Lil Yatty, it's been a thing. How do you, how do you pronounce his name? Lil Bo, anyway, say Lil Bo, right? It's been a thing I've seen recently in a lot of the kind of a SoundCloud sort of like uh, die dreads kind of people coming up now. Either there's been the big uh, trend of having the really thick braids where you get maybe the three or four of your little dreads and you kind of wrap them around each other. So you have these really thick, thick dreads coming, hanging down. Or there's a trend now of dyeing your hair, obviously, if it's been braided already or if it's been locked up. Or there's a trend now where you're seeing Little Boat, you're seeing Little Uzi Vert, where they're essentially taking whatever top bit they had that had dreads on it and making these kind of braids on the top which look really cool i think i might do that too to my hair because i'm at a point now where i can't really wear my hair out like this too much it looks a bit messy um and it's really long as well and needs, i think i probably need to cut some of the ends because they're probably been, they're probably bit, i've got a few split ends and i'm probably gonna do that kind of braid thing on the top but i, I like his i like his new approach his hairstyle maybe that might be an indication that the music is going to be a bit more stripped back it's going to be a bit more musically inclined it's going to be a lot less uh you know shiny bits the less glitz and glamour maybe i don't know i don't know if you can read people's haircuts into things but you should be able to same way like remember when jay-z when he's preparing to do a tune or to do an album sorry he goes into album mode and doesn't cut his hair and leaves his beard to grow out now obviously he's got the, the cool amazing little knots he has but that was the thing he used to do back in the day because he's always known to having the one level kind of shape up um anyways continue <laughs> working in an office nine to five the fact that he's been constrained in there maybe there's a cut fact that he's been released and he's going out into the open field i don't know pulls up in his car obviously it's not him driving it's somebody else he's about a hand color i don't think he loses he can lose if i drive he's great suck flying saucer drops in the middle of nowhere that's a big thing too, right? The suit and the kind of disheveled um, tie. That's obviously Prada. I think he's wearing there, judging by the badge. But that's a thing I've seen a lot lately. Um, maybe it's a Saint Laurent thing. Maybe it's a Celine thing. There's been, I think, Lucas about wore something similar. Um, the sort of like you know, um, I've just pulled out of you know what's that place in uh, uh what's that place in LA with the wooden panels outside that everyone comes out of and kind of looks amazing walking out of it. Um, you got pulled out of one of those kind of members only clubs. You kind of unloosen your tie. Um, it reminds you of like, remember that epic uh, picture of uh, Ben Affleck when he's coming out of a place somewhere super drunk. He doesn't want anyone to see his face. So he puts this plastic mask on over him. 
and he's like trying to find his way to his car. <laughs> He looks really good too, by the way. I don't know if it's. Did he take off his tattoos for this video? Or did he make them all? I think so, right? Yeah. I think so, that's why his face is so weird. And then I think the makeup comes off when. Yeah, right? And the makeup comes off when. Yeah, right? the makeup comes off when. Yeah, right? Eternal Take, Lucy Vert, the album, uh, directed by Gibson Hazard and Lucy Vert. Yeah, can't wait to see when that comes out. Creative direction on it already looks pretty impressive, as is. Um, next, I think on there we've got the track list, I think has come out of it as well, right? So a picture of the track list. It's quite hard to judge by this picture because the picture is super small, but I don't know what we've got in here. The opening track is Baby Pluto. Then you've got a track called uh, Low Main. You got Silly Witch, number three, pop. You got Better Move. You got Homecoming. You got I'm Sorry. You got Celebration Station. You got Bigger Than Life. Uh, you got Chrome Heart Tags, which I love that name, of course, because Chrome Hearts has had an epic. Res You'd never think back in the day. I remember from, again, from buying streetwear for a long time now and being part of the scene for a long, long time. I remember Chrome Hearts and Goro's being that kind of like, you know, the standout sort of jewelry pieces that a lot of the sort of like um japanese obsessed uh fashionistas used to love especially streetwear dudes right you'd wear goros and chrome hearts as your jewelry because you know there's stuff that you couldn't really get that often and i think there was a small contingent of people who used to also try and swag out tiffany's that was when tiffany's was kind of like you know ironically cool but chrome hearts was quite gaudy chrome hearts is like the kind of um i don't know it was a kind of gaudy version of Goro's. Goro's was a little bit more refined, right? The fact that you had to go up there and queue at the store every day in the morning, similar to like a Hermes thing. Um, it just gave it a little bit more of a luxe feel. It was all handmade. There's only certain places you could get it from. Most of the stuff people was wearing in London at the time was secondhand and they got from maybe Bid Service or um, Yahoo JP. So to not see it flipped and I see people fiending over, <coughs> over Chrome Hearts, it's pretty simplistic, right? They have the same sort of logo um, in that... Um, that's all that like chrome thing on most of the jewelry pieces. There's no real innovation behind it. It's, it's not like it's not as if people are wearing. It's like the equivalent of somebody choosing chrome hearts over great frog. Great frog jewelry is, is much better. Uh, he has much better range. It's much more diverse, much more versatile than anything uh, um, chrome hearts puts out there. And um, again, maybe I just think the chrome hearts thing because it's just so expensive. It's just like a marker of kind of oh how rich you are or how wealthy you are or a position you a disposable income you have because I don't really see the actual lore of it. I get it, um, how it looks, it's quite, you know, it's quite foggy, it probably reminds me a little bit of um, uh, True Religion in that regard, it has that weird kind of hood luxe feel behind it, which is very strange, if you go to a, a Chrome Hearts store, or you see the people that actually work at Chrome Hearts, they don't look anything like the people that wear it, so that's very interesting, but yeah, um, big up to that, um, him naming that, so I'm assuming we're going to see a really cool collab with that maybe coming up, then we've got a trap called Bust Me, we've got Prices, we got Urgency featuring Sid, which looks like the only feature on the whole album. He's got one feature and it's featuring Sid from the internet, which is very interesting. So again, maybe so judging by the lack of tattoos or in the, in the kind of trail, especially when he's in his suit, the fact that his hair is very simple, uh, the fact that he's just being a bit low-key anyway, the fact that he went back to the drawing board and reading his album after his feedback from Tyler, and the fact that he's only got Sid on it makes you think that there is it's going to be a lot more musically inclined than previous tapes, maybe. Um, less of the kind of boom boom kind of like big um, stadium festival kind of rockers that he's kind of known for and more of the kind of you know emo uh, trap shit that he was kind of that he came up from from the first out from the first um, mixtape that I remember listening to which was was I remember the first one that was really really emo um, that might be Love Is Rage isn't it yeah that, that was probably Love Is Rage let's see Love Is Rage track list I think that was the first one that was incredibly incredibly emo um, yeah that was the one no, not Love is Rage 2, just the original Love is Rage. Let's see if I can get on here. From 2015. That was one I think that was incredibly emo. And yeah, that was the one with the incredible album cover with him and reaching out to the old girlfriend, right, from back in the day. So that was the one, right? he got Safe House, Band from TV, Super Saiyan, 7am, Yamborghini Dream with Young Fog, Right Now, Moist Top, Kessel with Young F with Luis Khalifa. Oh, there's some fucking banging tunes on here, man. But yeah, um, big up Luzi Vert. 
interested to see how this is going to roll out. Um, again, I think it's a different direction for him going forward. One feature, the other, the other track you got here is Venetia, and then you got the the end at the end. So and Footshell Shuffle and that way as well is coming up. So yeah, um, interesting to see what it's what it's going to be like. Let's look at this. Let's see. Check his Instagram stories and see what else he's posted so far. Because I'm interested to see what this album sounds like when it drops. But yeah, okay, nothing so far there. Drank with Rick. I'm that sick. Oh, he's still drinking lean and shit. Oh, bless him. Sid's gonna be on there. That new Sid. Sid. Okay, let's go. Yeah, can't wait. I can't wait to hear what that sounds like. Uh, big up Louis Vert. That's album news there. Um. So let's get into some streetwear and clothing news, right? Number one news to talk about is Raph Simmons and Prada have joined forces. Now, um, I'm gonna be a bit contrarian in this because I don't, I'm not really as excited as everyone else is. I think there's been rumors for a long time that Raph has been consulting on Prada for a while. Um, I think maybe since maybe a three seasons back or something, there's always been a feeling that if if not if if there hasn't been a consultation, they maybe do swap notes. Because you're seeing a bit more of an influence of Musha Prada, especially the last collection with the sort of like weird pouches in the front and the sort of PVC wrap things around and the kind of proportions and some of the cuts of the stuff. Like it does feel a little bit like there's a bit of Musha Prada sprinkling in there. So maybe there's like a two-way relationship where they kind of, you know, as peers and as people who respect each other quite highly, they've been featured in magazines together. They look like they do speak often. Um, there's probably a bit of a kinship there, maybe, a, you know, whatever it may be from the fact that they're really talented and the fact that they're the last of the dying breeds of like really stellar, hyper-talented designer designers, right, who are respected by both consumers and people within the industry, which is very rare nowadays, especially with how people are so cynical and shit. Um, so maybe this collaboration was on the cards anyway, but I got the feeling that Raph was going to maybe concentrate more on his own brand ever since the kind of, you know, the Calvin Klein implosion. I think on paper, Calvin Klein looked like a really good fit for him, a place for him to kind of impose his, um, or to kind of, you know, give, uh, to stamp his sort of like um, design aesthetic on a house on the brand that's sort of struggling for relevancy struggling to kind of recapture the youth market and also an opportunity for him to kind of reinterpret and to kind of review or reinterpret basically uh americana luxury fashion in the way that he sees fit i think that's the best way you kind of get the best way of raf right when he kind of gives you his interpretation of a subculture his interpretation of a scene his interpretation of an era and kind of you know puts it out there with a sort of raf sprinkling and I thought after the whole Calvin Klein shit, you know, the tussle with the with the with the higher ups, the stuff that happened at Dior, that he'd kind of just concentrate on doing his own brand because I think if, if as Rick Owens has probably proved, right, with his kind of he uh, hesitancy or his reluctance to like sign back on again with Adidas, and the fact that he went in another direction with Veja, with that kind of vegan brand that he's kind of um, collaborating with now, with the V on the end of it and doing a lot of stuff in house. Sometimes signing some of the your rights away or giving or allowing other people to come into the room and decide other things because sometimes dilute your message and it also be a, a super annoying if you're like a i mean you know a really headstrong zebra forward charging creative like a raf simmons like a rick owens right there's only so many notes you can take from executives or marketing assistants who just want to kind of get their two cents in so i would have thought raf will just concentrate raf, raf simmons and i guess uh, the fact that we've seen some really strong collections from him since he left Calvin made me think that the more time he has to concentrate on his own brand, that he will get much better uh, output for us as customers, right? Even the footwear that's come out re recently has been really good. But I also have the impression that Ralph Simmons really likes having a job. He really likes being employed. He really likes working for somebody and going to office. And I think maybe it might be the fact that he's kind of come like an old era where designers didn't necessarily have that luxury of having their own brand the whole idea because you look you hear that sentiment a lot when you watch a show studio with like the panelists are mostly students you do get the impression that they even nowadays with the dtc brands i mean direct to consumer brands and people putting stuff up on shopify and have their own kind of online store that they sell their wares on and sell stuff through instagram you do get the feeling that nowadays the conversation has changed where like you can sell stuff directly to your customers without having to go through the fashion week cycle the fashion week calendars the showroom calendar um whoring your stuff around to shops and stuff you can just find your tribe and sell directly to them, right? Again and again and again. And usually that's the best way to kind of, you know, again, to kind of uh, do your best work without having the voices of buyers coming in and telling you to change the trim on that jacket because the cut, that color's not in or that cut's not in or that application's not in. Um, but I do get a feeling that maybe Raf is a, a generation, a, a, a generation, he's from a generation that prides, that takes a lot of pride in the fact that they have a job 
or that they have like a letter headed bit of paper or a business card that shows because it's a sort of like a stamp that the industry still thinks you're a good designer i don't know there's something in that like i look at nicholas fucking guest gear the same way too does he really need to work for louis vuitton does he really need to do that couldn't he not especially with the name that he has and how he's known for you know uh He's, like his futuristic take on fashion and materials he uses and application and the fact that he cuts like a genius does he really need to do that at Louis Vuitton could he not do something similar at a lower level of course not with the Louis Vuitton um, resources or production but he could do something similar at his own level and I think Raph could do the same thing too but it seems like he just wants to do it but anyway the Raffing might not be a good example because he maybe he has a once in a lifetime opportunity of working with one of his biggest mentors in Lucia Prada that he couldn't turn down but I'm not too sure I'm sold on the idea of two designers designing under one house especially two um alpha designers not really not respect like who takes the lead who doesn't take the lead i don't i'm not really sure if the house is going to work out but the announcement happened recently they announced it and everyone in fashion land went google gaga um i'm just a bit like i'm, I'm waiting to see what actually happens because i'm not too sure how this is actually going to work because so far we've seen that raf has been unable to kind of work within the constraints of big houses um, but maybe again working with somebody that he deems to be a mentor somebody he deems to be a peer somebody he respects we might see the best version of rap there so it's an article for business of fashion i'm going to pull up here um this is the following rap simmons is joining prada what does it mean for the italian mega brand so this article from business of fashion written by chantel fernandez uh tamenson o'connor and vikram alexi kansara Says the following: After months of speculation, Raf Simmons is joining the House of Prada. Oh yeah, the speculation too. There was a rumor out there. I remember. I think Brian Brian Boy might have been the one that started it. I'm not sure if he was being sinister, but he did suggest something along the lines of maybe uh, Raf Simmons was going to Givenchy, which would have been fucking insane. Considering that I think some of the best work we've seen at Givenchy has been from Ricardo Tisci, who had a very de um, distinct idea of male masculinity. Right, this kind of rugged beefier dude and the fact that raf simmons idea of masculinity is very ephemeral it's very effervescent it's very like wafty very slim very young um clean shaven uh do you know what I mean that would have been a very cool contrast to see how they both interpreted Givenchy codes um using different kind of um avatars or different kind of ideas of male masculinity i would like to have seen that but again it's not happening so, um, the cerebral Belgian designer who was previously designed for Jill Sander, Christian Jill and Calvin Klein will take up. So again, he does love having a job. Those are four big jobs he's had in the past. And all throughout that time, I think you, you could probably argue his best work has come from Raph Simmons. The ones that, the things that he's actually known for or that he's iconic for or people that actually remember, like, oh yeah, shit, that's an actually crazy thing has been Raph. I think of the massive Parker. I think of the, uh, I think of the, I think of the old, the patchwork, um, camo MA1. I think of the jeans, I think of the trainers, I think of the hoodies. It's all been from Raph Simmons' like, own label. It's not been from Jill Sander, Christian Dior, or Calvin Klein. There's obviously, the Calvin Klein, you've had some really great boots that have come out from that people are really obsessed about, but I can't think of anything from Dior that I've, I've, I've seen people like fiending over, maybe some jeans and shit, but most of his stuff's been from his own collection. So again, maybe he just loves having a job. Um, the Cerebral Bone designer will take up the role of co-creative director which you know, I've not really heard before, working alongside Musha Prada with equal responsibilities to creative direction, decision-making, and unconventional configuration. The appointment is effective on April the 2nd, 2020. The first show as a co-creator, director will come in spring, summer 2021, men's women's work presented in Milan. Now, the cool thing about this is that Musha Prada has always done like co-ed shows or like shows that have been mixed-gendered or like kind of um, gender-neutral shows where they, not gender-neutral shows, more so she always mixes the men's and the women's or women's and the men's in the same show. So there is, so that will be quite cool. And there's always a continuity. There's always a kind of theme that ties them together. Um, it's never something, you know, sometimes people will stick a male model in a women's fashion show and just kind of pop, it just kind of stick out like a sore thumb. Whereas I've, it feels like with Misha Prada, it's always seamless. It always tells a story. There's always like a relationship between both people. Um, they, they, they kind of live within the same world. So that's pretty, there's not like a merely an observer standing on the sidelines. So that might work really well. Uh, Simmons, who continue to design his namesake menswear label, is the first major talent um uh from outside of prada family to join the house since its inception wow in 1978 misha prada inherited the label as a luggage maker and transformed it into the global fashion brand with her creative designs beginning with the launch of the company's first successful handbag design the uh the rendered in black nylon 1985 the ready to wear offered offering launch in 1989 since simmons abruptly exited uh, calvin klein where he was chief creative director Chief Creative Officer, sorry, in December 2018, he was focused on his menswear line, but rumors of his possible involvement in Prada picked up steam in recent months. 
Prada is a brand that I have been interested in my whole life. I cannot wait to express all you. Um, I cannot express to all of you the dialogue I will have with Mrs. Prada and her team. Simon said in a secretive conference for Select Press held at the company's headquarters to announce the news, which is interesting, isn't it? A closed door press conference. Um, to do it, fashion is always fashion is the last place where it's still quite uppity. It's still quite snotty about things, right? Art is this art. You can just go on newexhibitions.com, I think and find private views of some of the best exhibitions happening in the world or happening in London or in the UK and go to them, attend them and rub shoulders and elbows with some of the biggest high flyers in the industry. But fashion is still the only scene where it's quite hard to find out when the next fashion show is happening. It's quite hard to get in the room, right? But all the pictures, everything that happens, everything that happens within that room is available on the internet instantly. But to actually getting it physically is very difficult. It doesn't make any sense really that, isn't it? It's like the opposite of Bergheim. Like there's no pictures of the inside. You don't know what's happening until you get in there. And to get in there is really difficult, right? You just have to go. It's one of those kind of things. But fashion is like they stop you from going in. But then instantly, if just standing outside, you can see everything. You'll probably live stream off your phone. Um, it's the last real kind of place where people are really kind of... Uh, there's a last place where there's actual gatekeepers, it seems like, for the most part. Um, Simon said in a secretive conference for Select Press, two days after uh, Prada's last show, last show for the brand. To be really honest, Mr. Bertelli approached me right after my exit from Calvin Klein, Simmons continued. Misha and I had a conversation about creativity in today's fashion system, and it brought me to open dialogue with many designers, not just Prada. We have to re we look at how creativity can evolve in today's fashion system, of course. And this might be a, a reaction to the stuff. Remember when um, Raf said some really disparaging stuff about Virgil? This might be part of the re uh, relationship that they probably had this f f uh, WhatsApp group where they kind of hate on everyone, right? Because you hear comedians say that often. Like, comedians say, like, their WhatsApp group or their kind of message threads that they have with people in the industry are mostly predicated on the, on the fact that they kind of, you know, rinse people in the industry who they think aren't deserving of their fame. But then in public, they'll never say it, which I think is quite cool. I think there is a level of, there is a level of honesty and humility behind the idea that, you know, they can be honest enough to say, look, we are hating behind the scenes, but we don't, we never let it affect the person's pocket. We're not going to be saying stuff to agents and booking managers not getting shows. But amongst our peers, we will say to ourselves, oh, that's shit, that's bad. But outwardly, if someone asks us about a fellow comedian, we protect our own and say, no, it's not for me or it's not something I've listened to lately, but I'm going to support him because he's a comedian like me and he's going through the same trial and tribulation, right? I, I like that idea. So maybe this is kind of stemmed from that group chat. They've had a group chat where they've kind of shitted on everyone. Oh, how the fuck has Virgil got that job? Blah, 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 blah. And then instead of complaining about it in general, they've made a, a solution or a, uh, an alternative. And I think that's the best thing to do with fashion. I think that's the best thing to do nowadays in fashion because there's going to be, I think we're going to see a lot more of these kind of Virgil people pop up where they kind of rise up from nowhere and they kind of have unconventional backgrounds and they're not classically trained. We're going to see a lot more of them. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think the thing that fashion needs more so, we need more of the Virgil types and we also need more of the kind of conventional, I went to fashion design school, but I've also got my own brand. We don't want the kids leaving university and being so desperate to kind of work for fucking, you know, um, Alexander McQueen and just kind of giving all their best years as a queen and having nothing to give after they finished it we want those kids who got the ability to go to fashion school to get accepted uh, to go through that whole rigmarole of four to five years however long it is to get a degree um, get a master's and leave and become very proficient at making clothes we also want to see them make their own brand so they, they so that they can offer an alternative to what somebody like a virgil is doing the problem is that when you have only the kind of Virgil people out there who are kind of the creative director of a brand and they have people, other people doing most of the stuff for them and don't have maybe a conventional fashion background, is that it then dilutes what the capital of fashion is. I'm sure Virgil will admit that too. He needs the kind of conventional fashion designers too to kind of bounce off of and to work from and to kind of react off of and they need him too. So maybe this is going to be part of the process. So he continued here. Uh, da, da, da. Simmons is one of the most influential designers in the industry, already has a relationship with the Prada group. Mushia and per Patricia Bertelli hired Simmons as creative director for Jill Sun in 2005, which makes sense, and they controlled the brand and were looking for somebody to fill the shoes of a nascent designer. Simmons' seven-year tenure at the brand was critical and commercial success, and the Prada group sold it to a London private antiquity firm in 2006. We've known Raffs for a very long time, back in 2005 when I first went to meet him in Antwerp, said Bertelli. Besides being an engaged in fashion, it's, just, it's not just a professional relationship it's a human relationship we share which is awesome I mean, that's the best collaborations not so just you know because oh we got two we got a brand you got a brand you talk to kids i talk to kids let's join them together and make loads of money it's it's great when there's actually a mutual love relationship between them because you get far more interesting propositions you get a better process uh the clothes are more interesting there's there, there is an idea that they're just doing it for the sake of doing it like they both don't need the money right even though i say Raf Simon loves having a job i'm sure he's financially well set 
I'm sure uh, Richard Prada is very well, well set too. It's just an exercise in creativity, right? They're both very talented. They're both very capable and they're just bored. They want something to kind of, you know, give them that kind of spike and give them that kind of jolt back in the ass again. And this probably is a great way to do it. Um, Simmons has described Mutual Prada as a true pioneer in fashion and acknowledge her influence on his work. On all levels, I can see Mutual's clear vision. Um, her mindset, her view on the world and her view on art and her political opinions, said Simmons in a 2016 interview with Prada in a sister magazine, which I talked about earlier. And as one person, she's able to construct and share that on such a huge scale. I find that mind blowing. Prada returned the reputation in the same interview. Sometimes I think I've had a fantastic idea. And Olivier, who works with me and Fabio on the shows, knows Raph's work so well, says to me, Musha, Raph already did that before. Uh, the two had a deep shared appreciation for contemporary art. Simmons' longtime right hand, uh, Peter Moyler, or Pieter Moyler, uh, will not accompany the designer in his new position. Moyler posted congratulations on Instagram, adding good luck with the big next big step. Strange to be not be by his side and he'll be our biggest fan. As for whether Simmons' appointment amounts to a retirement plan for Mutual Prada, the designer said in a chuckle, absolutely not. I like working and I'm very excited. This will bring new, new wind. Please don't make me older than I am. Uh, but asked about the length of the contract the Simmons, Prada signaled that it could theoretically last for life. It furious forever. Indeed, the arrival of Simmons and the perpetual nature of his contract sets up a possibility of a smooth passing in a creative torch sometimes uh sometime down the road a seemingly smart move to secure the future of the brand which is very true and also an indication that as annoying as fashion is to get in right i think everyone that's worked in fashion knows that loads of the kind of middle pe the people that work on the middle level right the mid-level managers they're sort of like the worst gatekeepers usually the people at the top the main designers don't give a shit and they'll give an opportunity if they have one but the ones on the middle level or some 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 of the entry level too because it's so hard to get in there's a lot of poverty scarcity mindset everyone thinking that the opportunities are very scarce which they are because no one leaves those kind of jobs but smash is also a good opportunity because it shows that if you're talent you have the ability you also have the opportunity to have a job for life like someone will, will allow you to uh the arts are the same too right you get patrons and you get people that kind of support you and just kind of fund your life so you can kind of create art and not do anything else and i think fashion is the same way if they see your talent they see you've got the ability they will make sure you're in a you're in a position where all you have to do is focus on fashion and nothing else and that's pretty cool um so yeah that's the whole kind of article i'm not gonna read the whole thing but yeah uh raf is joined prada congratulations to him hopefully we see some core interesting things from both of them in the near future let's move on got a little more stuff to rattle off here um oh yeah um off-white and jordan four breads so these are coming back out so obviously we've seen that jordan fives come out which sold out in record time i didn't get them l's everywhere big up me but we've also seen rumors of the breads that we saw uh displayed in the uh in the virgil abloh retrospective exhibition that's going around i think it's next place is going to boston or something i think it's in atlanta at the moment um that exhibition is probably is a very uh, great way for him to kind of encapsulate all his work that he's done he's kind of tied it into this really cool narrative but he's got this amazing sort of platform it looks like from the pictures where he kind of lays out all the prototypes and all the kind of um, ideations that went into creating some of the best work that he's done so far, which has been the Nike 10 collaboration that came out a few, a couple of years ago. Um, and part of that collaboration, you see some of the stuff that has been kind of like, you know, that wasn't, uh, that didn't uh, pass the final stages of approval. But I also think it was a clever tactic by Nike or by Off-White or by Virgin in general, because it makes me think of, do you remember when they did that massive show for Yeezy or they did that massive or they did that kind of like private sort of like dinner thing in a hotel somewhere where they were DJing from an iPhone and it was sort of like a weird uh, kind of focus group where they got all their cool friends around in the room and had them exchange ideas. You play a track, you play something and then they kind of contribute and put it all together so you can, so can kind of contribute to Yeezys. I also think that may be part of it, right? This massive table of rejects was a way for them to kind of do some um, real life market research because when those pictures came out, first of all, when the first exhibition launched, I remember people zooming in and cropping out the images that they thought were sick of the shoes they thought would come out. So I remember it being the Jordan ones in yellow. I remember it being the obviously the the fives. I remember it being the Jordan four breads that we're going to see now and the, and the ones that are off white and a few others, right? And then it's no coincidence that now all of a sudden you're hearing rumors that they're all going to come out. So I think it's a very clever. If, if it should be very clever if it was purposely done if it's accidentally done and you just reacted to what's happening into it fair enough but i also think it's very clever that he just did that so instead of because obviously a nike 10 collaboration was a very big risk for nike because they put a lot of shoes out they could have all like i remember virgil saying it right it was one of the biggest risks in his career because shoes are serious business right when you fuck those up your name is done right so he took that risk he decided to do a collaboration with nike in that on that big of a scale did it smashed it 
but they produced a lot of those shoes because a lot of the shoes were hanging, especially the, the mo- less popular model, like the 97. You could still got them um, in shops for retail if you were kind of looking around hard enough. So they probably didn't want to produce the same amount of level of in- shoes again. They weren't sure about the interest. So a good way to do it, put some shoes out via a gallery or let Virgil put them out on the table, let people take pictures of them freely because, you know, there's no nothing protecting them. There's no kind of, you can't take pictures in here. or they, You know what I mean? There's none of that sort of stuff. People can do what they want with the pictures. And then through the kind of engagement online, you see the ones that work, put in production, and then bang, Bobby John Grenadier you're on. Now I'm a big, I'm a big fan of them because, as you know, if you listen to this podcast long enough, I say my top three shoes of all time are no particular order are the Nike Air Max 90, the Air Force 1, and the Jordan 4s, right? And if, if I say colorway, I'll say Air Max 90. I'll say Air Max 90 infrared. If I'm saying Air Force 1, I'll say Air Force 1 or white. And if I'm saying Jordans, I'll say Jordan Bread, right? Jordan 4 Breads. They're my favorite shoe. I think it represents to me the pinnacle of what Tinker Hatfield was about during that era. The mix of like 90s and 80s and uh, kind of shoe design. The fact that it's a midfoot shoe. Um, the exposed mesh on it makes it remind you of an Air Train and One. The Air Bubble, of course. Very Air Max 90, Air Max 1 flavoring on it. And just in general, just a very um, solid shoe. Very versatile. Works amazingly with shorts. In a sort of like, you know, camo shorts with a punk band t-shirt on. Works well with some combats on. Combat trousers with some, you know, with a nice fucking architect's jacket on. Works very well with a great button down suit uh with some flared pants like it just works with every kind of outfit and i'm just a big fan of it in general i think it's kind of a gen- and, and it represents again one of the greatest colorways ever seen right the bread colorway black white and red um or grays and red really, really perfect and they're gonna maybe release the one that we showed they showed in the exhibition um it's essentially a flip on the bread you've got this amazing sort of like a faded out mud guard or kind of toe box mud guard thing on the t- on the front which is kind of similar to me because it reminds me of my Jordan 4s that I bought from the Defining Moments pack. I think that was the first bit that sort of died out. I'm not sure if it's because of scuffs or because of when I was going out. But it also might be a nod to the fact that these shoes were also very popular within the skateboarding world. I forgot where it was. It might have been Philly or something. But I remember there was a particular area, maybe it might be New York, where a lot of people were wearing Jordan 4s as like a really cool as a really cool like shoe. And again, you can you can see why it makes sense, right? It is similar in shape and in profile to like a DC or like a D3 or like an Osiris kind of shoe. So that that's makes sense but that could be a nod to that so that kind of thing is like the idea that you know when you're flipping a skateboard ollieing it and you're kind of your foot is kind of scraping against the grip tape it would sort of make that kind of fade out mark on it especially with the black and like the fact that the the, the mesh has been kind of flipped and highlighted and contrasted up and made into white the wings as well are translucent so is the back heel tab and the little um outsole here in the middle and just in general just a really really beautiful way to kind of do the shoe um again Rumors are they're coming out. You've got the air bubble, of course, there on the side. Um, this is the original picture of them actually in the exhibition here. I think they're there. You can see them at the front, how beautiful they look. Again, with the kind of um, the raw cutting of the inner, inner sole and the tongue here. They look fucking beautiful. I think the, the, the pair here is maybe a... Is that an actual real pair or is that... I think that is a real pair, but the shape is so beautiful. It's like a proper like... It's got that really pointy kind of... A shape that I like in my Jordans where it's not got the banana foot in it. I'm not sure if it is going to be the one. But anyway, this is from Kicks on Fire. It says the Jordan 4 bread um, off white is rumored to come out during the fall. Um, it now seems that not one but two different off white Jordan 4s are collabs are coming to release later this year. Aside from the off white Jordan 4 um, SM women's sale that we I'm going to show you next that happened that he debuted at Paris Fashion Week, it's now being said that the off white Jordan 4 bread sample will also be getting a retail release. The off white Jordan 4 bread sample was unveiled when it was displayed at Virgil's Figures and Speech Exhibition in Chicago's Museums of Contemporary Art. The shoe dons a bread aesthetic along with added unique details such as the translucent wings, new textured toe, and an air on the midsole. Above you'll find a mock-up of the F4. Okay, that's a mock-up done by Soul Debrief. So this is obviously a mock-up done on an OG pair because that shape is just too good. I knew that wasn't that wasn't the one. Uh, let's continue here. Um, although there's confirmed, there's no. There, although there is confirmed info yet, there's no confirmed info yet. The Off-White Jordan Four Bread is expected to release sometime during the month of August. Uh, stay tuned for more images. So that is one of them, right? So that's my favorite shoe of the one. And then the second one that he debuted, which I think again is fucking beautiful. And I didn't think it was sale. I thought it was off white or an off white, off white. But I don't know. Maybe that's true. Maybe it is sale. Was the this one that he debuted during the past Fashion Week on the runway? They look fucking banging. It's unfortunate they're women's. I guess if you're a men's size, they do go up to like a 13, which is like a UK, which is like a men's 9.5. You can probably get a pair. Uh, but they are fucking beautiful. But it's interesting because some, two of the best sort of colorways in women's Jordans have been probably one of two of my favorites in Jordans 4s in general. That one by that lady, is it something Kim? 
that had the pony hair Jordan 4. You remember those? Let me see if I can find them. Uh, pony hair Jordan uh, 4. It's in black, right? Let's see, it's this one. I forgot who Dan did them. Uh, this is a pinnacle shoe by who's who does who's a good collaboration? Who did this? I don't know who did it, but was it what's her name? Olivia Kim. That's it. She did a whole pack of these, right? Remember? And these are fucking banging. And these are probably some of the best shoes, probably some of the best ones I've seen from Jordan. And they're kind of women only, unfortunately, right? So they didn't go up to a certain size, but they saw like the black cats, but it's got the pony hair on them. Um, let me get the pony hair on them, right? And you've got these whole like Peyton, is it Peyton? Would you call that Peyton or plasticized wings on it? All black, pony hair all over it. Fucking beautiful shoe. But anyway, um, going back to the sales. So these are the ones that debuted during Paris Fashion Week. You've got the convention, again, um, the usual sort of like mock-up on them, translucent wings and heel tab, the air written on the midsole, translucent sort of like four foot mid, sort of four foot sort of like sole bit in the front there. Um, and then you've got a completely sale sort of upper, which makes me remind you of the kind of, you know, those Hender Scheme shoes from Japan that are sort of like handmade in leather and shit. And it reminds me of those. Um, so those are due to come out very, very soon. Um, this is an article from Hypebeast. Following the debut of Sneaker during the Off-White Fall Winter 2020 presentation, we now have a glimpse of detailed photograph, photograph of the head turning Jordan 4. Uh, keeping in line with the sample shoe senior credit director Virgil Abloh's figure speech exhibition, the shoe which will be offered in women's sizes is executed in an e-crude e sale colorway. Okay, it's sale. I thought it was Off-White, but it is sale. If you look at the outfit that that person's wearing, it is sale. I love that they put the outfit. I love the con unconventional use of Jordans, like placing Jordans with a suit. Especially something with that such a lighter fabric, it's pretty cool. Uh, you know, because most people that are wearing them are gonna be wearing them with raw denim jeans or with really big baggy combat trousers. So the fact that they kind of you know flipped them and gave them this feminine touch um, by putting them in lighter fabrics, lighter colorways, lighter materials, lighter styling is really really cool. I really like that. Um, so we've got here the, the, the that's the look of them. You got here a little pic of someone wearing them right with the suit from the last collection. The actual shoe itself looks fucking beautiful. The upper is that new buck? Probably is new buck, right? It will be, you know, be pretty awesome if they did as well to add to it. Like it was no liner, like so, like, no stitching. It was just all one piece. That would be pretty cool. Uh, but I like the, I like everything about it. It's all sale everywhere. It looks like it's a new bucky kind of feel with bright white laces. I look fucking banging. I quite like the laces, those sale laces, but I quite like the white contrast there with the kind of midfoot here. Um, and then of course you've got the breads which are due to come out too. Oh, look at the front. The front isn't what I thought it was. It's not faded out suede. It's that same sort of like translucent mesh that you saw on the Jordan 5s. And then the midsole, okay. And then that mesh on the forefoot here isn't white. It's black. Interesting. So, and it's black as well on the midsole. It's not white as it was. So I don't sure what shoe is going to come out. I'm not sure if it's the one that we're seeing on Kicks on Fire, which is this, which is the one I prefer is that one, right? I think this shoe is actually the better one to this personally, but again, I wouldn't be mad at either. Um, and yeah, so there, there's the off-white sale we saw as well in the in exhibition. So yeah, I think it's fair to say that every colorway tier so far has come out. So we're probably going to be able to, we're probably going to see, you know, that that uh, one, the Jordan one with the yellow toe box probably coming out very soon. We're probably going to see maybe that shoe there. I forgot the name of it. That was Hiroshi Fujira did a collaboration of there with the front there. We're probably going to see a few of these shoes coming out now that they're doing this. Uh, above compared the original sample to the shoes of the fully realized silhouette seen in the off-white runway in Paris. Meanwhile, golfer Pat Perez recently teased the recently the court-ready pair of Jordan 4 golf sneakers. Okay, cool. But yeah, that's the shoe there again. Off-white Jordan 4 Jumpman. You've got obviously Virgil posting or Carl had posting a picture of sneakers and heels. So yeah, these are due to come out very soon. They both look amazing. I think again, some of the some of the best work Virgil's done has come via Jordan and come via Nike. So um definitely these are up there with some of them. And again, I'm a big fan of the bread colorway. I think it's probably the best shoe of all time. Top three for me, MX90, MX90 infrareds, uh, Jordan 4 breads, and obviously Air Force 1 all white. So yeah, due to come out very soon. Keep an eye on that if you're that way inclined. Next on the list here, we have Yeezy 451. Are you a fan of these? I'm not really a fan of these. They debuted, I think, during Paris Fashion Week again. Kanye was jumping out of his cab somewhere and trying to avoid the rain. And everyone was kind of looking at his feet and he had these weird leather tracks. He, he, Kanye loved leather pants, didn't it? I wonder what the leather pants thing's about. Is that like a rock thing? Is that like a... Um, is that like... If it's not a rock thing, is that like a... Um, just a kind of a swaggy luxury thing? Right, when you've had all the jeans in the world, when you've bought all the 
RRPs, when you bought all the Visvim jeans, you bought all the neighborhood jeans, you bought every kind of raw denim jean that's available, that's sick out there. The only other logical place to go to is to buy tailored trousers, right? Or to buy really, um, you know, it, ridiculous, you know, pleated um, Isimiyaki sort of like pants that cost you a thousand bucks, whatever it may be, right? Or to buy shitty designer jeans or to just go the other way and just buy some amazing leather pants that are all one of one. Um, they don't make many of them, you know, they source the best levers, blah, blah, blah. Maybe it's part of it, I don't know, but I've never really been the biggest, especially the way he wears them. I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of like the conventional kind of Ramstein look leather jeans, right? Like massive leather jeans with like, you know, maybe like a, maybe I'm thinking of, um, maybe I'm thinking of Chrome Hearts, like st simple, like flared or kind of, you know, 99% uh, uh, maybe, uh, what's, your, what's his name? The soloist sort of like leather pants where they're kind of, you know, really a rough looking um they're kind of raw um they don't have many embellishments there's no funky zips no weird paneling just really stuck to you they fit you like a glove they w work really well with new york boots or some massive dr martins right or some other kind of you know combat ready trainers and just they just get you up you just get up and go right i like those kind of things but but uh, Kanye obviously love prefers a more luxury 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 thing looking but um he debuted them during Paris fashion week this colorway I'm not a fan of. I think I remember seeing the colorway before when they were, when they were kind of got leaked. I was a fan of those more, but these look wild. And again, I think that's a good thing. I'm happy about Kanye existing in this sneaker space at the moment. Say what you like about Yeezy. You can like it. You can not like it. What he's what he has been doing. He has been kind of because I remember there was a point in time, especially when Kanye and Don C and those guys were heavily wearing retro Jordan fours. Right? There was a time where I was kind of a bit like I was a bit tired of like it was only retros that were coming out. Right? And some of the retros that they were bringing out, um, with the exception of Jordans, I think of some of the Air Maxes that came out, the Air Max lights and shit. Nike were doing such a bad job of retroing them, right? They were coming out with the banana shapes, the paneling was off, like everything was just rubbish, right? And they came out with these shitty excuses that, oh, the tooling is gone, we don't have the tooling, it costs a lot. Bruv, you're Nike, you're a billion dollar company, remake the tooling, buy an old pair of eBay and redo them. Like, come on, man, use your common sense, you know what I mean? Or just do them anyway. Serve the sneakheads what they can serve, but they just, they did like the least amount of effort and just put them out. So that for Kanye to go to Adidas and to purposely not do the easy thing, which would be to go to the archive and take some, because Adidas has some fucking killer stuff in the archive, right? You could have taken some really under, underrepresented or shoes that didn't get the love that they needed at the time shoes, put his kind of easy stamp on it and, and put them out and they would have sold out the same way. But he challenged himself and created a whole different silhouette, a whole different approach to sneakers. And they look nothing like anything else on the, on the market. So much so that when someone makes a shoe that looks like a Yeezy, the first thing you say is it look like a Yeezy. No, no Yeezy looks like another brand, unless you look at maybe the 700s or something, right? That might look like something like a New Balance. But everything has its really unique sort of like vibe and look to it. And I think that's what I have to give uh, Kanye props to, regardless if you like it or not. And this is another shoe of that kind of ilk. It's a 451 um, Yeezy. It's got this weird sort of like volcanic... Um, um, footbed on it where it sort of like um, encapsulate the whole upper like it's kind of like a it reminds me of like you remember um, Venom in Spider-Man right when the kind of thing is the ink thing is crawling all over you and it kind of seeps into your eye that's what it kind of reminds me of like it could take over the entire body um, it would be quite cool if they had an outfit or a look that actually had that level of weird melty vibe and flames that kind of went all the way up the trouser and connected to the jacket some kind of modular thing it reminds me of something that Ita Thorpe would really be good at, right? Remember what Ita Thorpe was doing stuff at Stone Island and Umbro? Like, that would be something he'd be really cool at. Some, somehow making an outfit or suit that kind of melds, that kind of joins in with the shoe and sort of like a one piece. That would be pretty sick. But anyway, Kanye decided to debut a pair of new Buck suede, it looks like, right? <laughs> 451s, right? It's really old to shoot. Of course, he's making them, so it doesn't matter. But in the rain in, in the rain in Paris, right? It's fucking, the, the flagrancy is up on another level, isn't it? Um, and again, I like the old model of the shoe. I probably don't like the colorway. I like the fact that they've got this weird thing where it looks as if like the the heel and the foot don't land on the floor. Instead, you're walking on your forefoot. It looks like so. So it's sort of like got like a bit of a moon shape at the bottom. I quite like that look of it. Um, this is an article from Paris Fashion from sorry Sneaker News. It says Kanye West debuts the Yeezy 451 at Paris Fashion Week. Um, each showing up um, of the previous energy. This year's serious fashion weeks is, is undoubtedly one of the... What? This writing is weird. Anyway, but off to the side, even far away from the front row, Kanye walked the streets of Paris in unreleased Yeezy uh, silhouette. One simply dubbed 
the Yeezy 451. Visually removed from anything in the current lineup, the pair swaps tooling from one aggress highly aggressive with its various molds extending upwards into a woven upper in angular spikes. Its base, which tints yellow here, obscenity constructs minimal as color is blocking. This English is weird. On this, where, anyway, let's continue looking at the picture. So yeah, the pants I'm not a fan of, the outfit I'm not a fan of at all. Um, he does that weird thing how he walks in there. He's having his mouth open, he slams his shoulder and does that. I don't know what that thing's about, but the shoes look fucking banging. He somehow avoided that massive puddle. It looks like a fucking ocean. And again, I'm a big fan of it, man. Um, these guys all look like special, former special forces guys, isn't it? They got that special forces bum, but it's all like high and tight. But yeah, uh, no homo there aside. Um, I love the shoe. I'm a big fan of it. It looks like nothing else available now in the market. Um, he's a great person to kind of debut shoes in that regard, right? He knows how to kind of floss and to kind of present shoes in a good way and kind of get them viral on the internet. You know, here he is on his amazing, in his, you know, his amazing outfit. Not for me, but I like the fact that he kind of came out in the flipping. Is that like a new buck baseball shirt is kind of shirt, leather pants and, you know, new buck suede shoes in the rain in Paris. But yeah, I like the model of it. It looks very slim, a very straight sort of shoe. It looks like a, a, a low for the most part. I don't see the padding going up here on the high. So it's probably a low shoe. But again, I think the another colorway with maybe some contrast on the flames would work better for me. But again, I'm interested to see what it looks like going forward. But I, I think it looks pretty interesting man, for the sake of it. So yeah, big up Kanye for, again, pushing the limits again when it comes to sneaker design and not having the conventional samey, samey kind of look, right? Because it could be easy to do that. But he said he always kind of goes for the joker and tries things a little bit more difficult. That's one. Move on here. And we say, uh, la, 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 the Yeezy clogs. I'm a big fan of two. This will debut two on sneaker news. Uh, I think I actually wore them actually on that one. Let me see if I can find them on here. I think they debuted here. Yep. So this is it. So I'm not sure if these are Nike clogs, same thing I've, I talked about before. I'm pretty sure it's the same model, right? So I think ASAP Ferg debuted or showed these again off on Instagram. But I'm a big fan of these, actually. I like what they look like. I'm going to get them up here on the screen. Um, I'm not sure if they're going to be biodegradable, if they're going to be like an environmental thing, or if it's just something that he's kind of had his idea or his kind of interpretation on Crocs. This could be his kind of version of Crocs or his version of clogs in general. I'm not too sure. But this is um, ASAP Ferg reveals the Adidas Yeezy clog in orange. <gasps> I'm not sure if it's called the Adidas clog as well. But anyway, we'll just run with that. And it also might be the shoe that Kanye spoke about quite um, um, often. He was going to create a shoe that was $50 or like an entry shoe that anyone could buy. This might be the shoe that does it. That is the one that's available everywhere. And it might be, a, that's probably why we haven't seen it drops. Um, we haven't seen it released um, yet because there's probably a lot of work to be done in behind the scenes to get it at a price point, to get a production level, to get at the manufacturing level where it can be made available to everybody and not sell out in minutes and also just be stocked everywhere, isn't it? Um, there's probably some things affecting that. So that probably might be the reason, but this might be the $80 or $50 shoe you spoke about. I could be, I'm not too sure. Let's continue here. This article says, from runway shows to subtle reveals, Kanye has certainly been busy, but if you also factor in this newly constructed HQ in Wyoming, it can become even clearer just how much the icon gets in the work. Gradually working to make his line and signatures more sustainable and higher quality, Ye has opted to start slow, by the way, of ALS Yeezy Clog, a slip on silhouette a la Crocs that utilizes algae to shape his aesthetically tuned vision. Shown in a clean bone, hip white first and foremost, many stated. Many started, e started uh, e equally awaiting the release and it's appeared in new colorways by way of ASAP Ferg. We may just be quite close. So yeah, true. If, if When you start seeing artists get a pair, because Kanye's been wearing them for a while, when you start seeing other people wearing them that aren't Kanye, you can kind of get the assumption, okay, cool, they're going to drop very, very soon. This is sort of like the the kind of the seeding stage of the shoe, isn't it? Because when Kanye's wearing them, you can probably tell there's probably a testing period. He's doing a few wear tests and wearing them around town, giving back, um, giving feedback to the design team, doing some fine edits and some tuning. And then once it reaches the hands of the ASAP Ferg, it's probably already done. There might be some, in, there might be some feedback in terms of colorways and other little bits, bits of changing, but the overall shape is probably already kind of got sorted. Um, Show me the, the, it's where ASAP Ferg, we may just be quite close. Expanding the rooster by one more notch, just after yet another brand new scheme walked at the runway of the Din Zhuang Central St. Martin show happened recently. The rapper has teased a vibrant orange rendition that disrupts the current neutral flows as it dies literally every accent in one warm tone. Grab a detail, look at these below. So yeah, I'm a big fan of them. Got here, um, got ASAP Ferg wearing a pair. So they look like they've got maybe a similar sort of like shape as a 700. I don't know if that's a true thing to say. Um, it's all one piece. Um, you just slot your feet in at the top. I'm assuming they're made all in one manufacturing process, probably. I'm not too sure. Um, loads of vents all around it for uh, 
for some nice airflow and make sure that your foot doesn't get nice and sweaty. The footbed has got this sort of like raised granular things in so your foot doesn't slide around everywhere. The actual midfoot or the sole of it is quite thick. You've got the big Adidas logo brand at the back here, which is different from all the other shoes that Kanye has done with Yeezy. They don't necessarily have a lot of over Adidas branding unless you look on the inside of the tag, I think for the most part, or the size label. So this could be the one that is available everywhere and anywhere for Adidas in general, just to kind of, again, break that market and allow Adidas to really become like, you know, a multi-billion dollar, a multi-billion dollar brand. Because this shoe, if it ends up being $50 or $80, I could see loads of, you know, I could see loads of um, what they call them um, non-profits taking those kind of shoes and giving them out to like, you know, people in less in, in uh, less affluent countries. I could also see them becoming part of like a design process or competition phases or stuff that's given to maybe medical professionals or whatever. Maybe or people like in the service industry that wear clogs, you know, Russian people are always wearing those black clogs that they wear when it's outside smoking. This could be kind of a new shoe for that regard. Loads of ways that it can kind of um uh, work its way into kind of the, the general discourse without people knowing that it's a thing because you know again they could just be in different colorways and look really cool and no one could even know it's easy just a shoe that they got for cheap because it was available in shoe or whatever it may be called right so this might be the yeah this could be the introduction to shoe or to, like, to office or whatever it may be in it so definitely keep an eye out for these i'm a big fan of them i think they look really cool um the adidas clogs or whatever they're going to be called we don't know the name of them so far but they're going with clogs so far um uh, da, 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 da. What else we got to talk about here? Um, I think that might be it. And it should we just move on? Oh no, let's just talk about this. Nike and Stussy are putting out this um Speridon Cage Two, which I've never heard of pers personally previous or previously. Sorry, I'm not really sure what this model is, but I like the look of it. Um, this is from Hype Beast. It says ASAP Nas reveals uh the Stussy Nike Air Zoom Speridon Cage. Now I'm not sure why ASAP Nas revealed it. Maybe it's because he lives in LA and he's very tied into the people that work at Stussy. Um, I forgot the guy's name that's part of it, does all the design stuff. So maybe that's part of it because he's friends. Or maybe in general, because um, Anas has done quite so a few really solid collections or collaborations lately, especially with uh, the Converse he done, sorry, not Vans. And I thought they looked really cool. He might be moving into doing so maybe some more apparel with Stussy. So that might be an avenue he's going into being a consultant. So that's probably why he got a pair early. But I like that he's kind of been used as the kind of de facto person to kind of seed out or to kind of leak these kind of unconventional sort of like under the radar less well-known models to his holder fans uh, who happen to be sneakerheads and then that kind of permeates into pop culture i think that works out pretty cool and there's a lot of and i'm and i'm sure he's very from very familiar very close to the stucci family out there in la so there's a lot of um there's a lot of uh what's that thing called a lot of connection there anyway they're, they're all friends isn't it? so that's pretty cool um so again i'm not sure sure on the model i've not seen the model previously before uh, maybe it's a newer model that hasn't really been uh, retro just yet, which Nike do tend to do quite often, where they'll put out a shoe as a collaboration first, as a retro before it gets retro for as a GR, it'll come out as a collab. Then when it kind of garners a lot of hype and people like it, they'll release it as a GR. Maybe taking some similar cues from the collab it done in terms of colorways, and then it will kind of then start dropping down and down until it's kind of readily available everywhere. So um, this is the shoe. It's a it's a kind of a what would you call it? It's a it's sort of like a conventional dad running shoe that you'd find in like TK Maxx, but it's got more of a bit of more of a sleeker futuristic sole on the upper. You've got this weird sort of like jacket print. You got this amazing kind of like um F not FFS. What, what do you call it? FFS. What's it called? Um, this sort of like two tony sort of like paneling straps all along the upper. You've got the swoosh on the side. You got a swoosh in the toe box. You got these weird little dots on the front, and then you've got some nice uh thick tubular laces up top as well so a really nice clean sort of shoe again something that you wouldn't really uh, know you wouldn't necessarily put this in the stucci co collaboration um catalog really you wouldn't necessarily pick this out of the archive because for the most part stucci's collaborations have been very much air max influenced or basketball influenced loads of mid tops and high tops loads of runners but runners maybe in the conventional sense with air bubbles you don't really see these sort of like sleek minimal sort of runners so maybe it's a different direction maybe it's part of a whole running athletic outdoor type of thing i don't know but let's look at it here update march the 5th uh okay original story so it's called cool. original and read up uh courtesy of asap nas the newly revealed team up is just one collaborative take which includes an air zoom sprayed on cg2 and four colorways of the benassi gd slide as revealed by the post of asap Movember in instagram stussy spin on the retro zoom sprayed on cage features a black and gray knitted mesh upper okay that's what we saw here metallic silver overlays and a decorative elements on the upper including a dotted black toe cap shiny swooshes and a mid foot and toe box co-branding on the tongue okay I didn't see the code burning on the tongue and the thing. Is it here? Is there Stucci written on there? Don't know. Um, 
period on tongue, the the decorative element. Take a look there. And then the update here at the top it says after a silver and black stushy colorway, um, Nas also revealed the second colorway is now surface. Uh, oh, which is this and off. Oh, that off white. Oh, ho, ho. that suede and mesh colorway looks banging. So it looks super weird when it's in. Okay, so that's mesh. It's not jack. Okay, cool. Wow, that off white colorway looks fucking flames. Okay, that's the one. That colorway is the one. The black, this one's fine, but this is the one. Especially with those pants that he has on as well. Epic, 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 epic. Um, so let's go back here. Um, another a cream colorway base with power, with a powerfully placed black accents on the midfoot, swooshes and heel cage. Da, da, da. A release date for both Spiridons yet to be announced, but early reports have them pegged at Spring Drop, accompanied by the four Benassi slide. Which where the where, what's a bit what's, what's a Benassi slide? By the way, I'm not sure. Okay, pirate um uh, pirate leaks has also said that they're gonna come out with them uh so there's two shoes there's a zoom spread on kk i don't know what that model is let's, let's see what that is let's find out what that is uh let's google that nike spread on kk what is that i don't know what that is what's a new spread on K okay cool it's this model right i'm assuming it looks so good though right let's just put this up here on top again so you can see it they look so good so this is the this is the OG shoe I'm assuming, right? Is that the OG shoe or is that the normal shoe? That red colorway is fucking beautiful. They usually do put out quite a lot of colorways anyway in the in the studio collaboration, so wouldn't be surprised. But this is a, from 2019. We've got here Zoom spread on KK will come in black, white, and what was it? Black, white, and bright cactus uh, with white, black, and habanero red, which we saw up there. And then the Zoom spread on CG2 will be pure platinum, black, and white. And then black, duh, 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 and then fossil, black, fossil. Yeah, that might be, yeah. So that might be the one. There's three, there's a lot of shoes coming out in one collection, isn't it? So you've got these coming out. You've got the greys, I'm assuming, with the flip on the mesh, the mesh is on the other side. Oh, it looks so beautiful. That's a nice shoe. Wow. Again, that's what I like about collaborations. You're able to take a shoe that no one gives a shit about, retro it, make it look banging. It then sells out hotcakes, and then Nike have the double, they can double dip by then putting them out as a GR. So everyone wins. I know back in the day it was a big risk for Nike to do it because they didn't want to, you know, risk to get the tooling out or make the tooling for an old shoe again, remake it, um, invest all they can into kind of R and Ding and shit, and it doesn't sell well. And then you've already kind of planned out the GR release anyway for a few months later, and that kind of falls on flat ears. You know, if you're the person that has your name attached to this and you have to report to your, you know, production manager, you're going to be sweating bricks, and I think you're going to get fired because you you fucked up. So I get the, I get the kind of. I get the kind of reluctance to put out newer models or to kind of put out less unknown models, but I think it's the way to go nowadays, especially with, you know, with, with there being so many hype shoes out there that have been purposely hyped for the sake of reselling. There needs to be a kind of a counterbalance where you kind of put out these shoes that are a little bit, little bit under the under the radar, but also have a little bit, you know, has to have the potential to kind of educate the newer generation and kind of steer them in direction where they can kind of, you know, keep this sneaker head thing going on. Because if, if kids are just, if kids are just going to stick to buying Jordan 1s, sneaker head culture is going to die a slow death but if they're able to do this then yeah oh look at those nine color at the top there bloody hell but yeah um i made to see i can't wait to we'll see when those come out um room and collaboration obviously got the red pair here that's on sneaker figure it looks fucking insane and then of course you've got this my favorite colorway so far this sort of sale colorway looks fucking banging so yeah definitely keep an eye out for those hopefully you see them soon i'm assuming it's gonna be some apparel probably tight them as well and um, what is a benassi slide by the way is that just the regular slide benassi slide <laughs> What is that? And why is it called the Bernasi? Is it because the person made it? Is it Italian or something? Okay, it's just a regular slide that they sell from Nike that I'm sure most of you guys are aware of. So that's a Bernasi slide. This sort of like regular slide that they make. So yeah, maybe it's an LA thing, isn't it? But yeah, let's let's see what happens with those going forward. Anyway, it's next. That was the X Nose English Show, episode number 288. Thanks so much for tuning in. As per usual, if you're listening via the podcast app, please give me a five star review. Share the show with your friends. Like, retweet, all that massive. If you're watching via YouTube, smash the like button, hit subscribe, leave your comment. Uh, check out my website, actionzinger.com. Follow me on Instagram, down below as well. Follow me on Twitter, down below as well. And I'll see you guys very, very soon. Take care, be safe, and be cool. Bye, peace.